morning to every one of you joining us. Okay, sorry, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning, good evening to everyone joining us from across the world. I am happy you're doing it's yet a Cody Fellow, Mandela Washington Fellow, and also President of African Young Female Advisors. I want to welcome you to this platform on where to next wait 1325. And we'll be talking about the agenda for this policy and where we're ex expecting the policy to move after this 20 years anniversary. It will be an intergenerational dialogue, bringing together women of different generation, race, ethnicity, tribe together to examine the key areas of focus for women's community peace and security work in the next five, 10, 20 years. Participants are encouraged to reflect on their learning and share your thought and share your thoughts on the chat box. Thank you and welcome to this section. So it will be an intergenerational dialogue between the older generation of women and the new generation of women to really dissect what has happened 20 years back and what we are hoping the policy could achieve in the next years ahead. So just a quick house rules to, on the section concerning the tips for our engagement throughout the section. The section will be recorded and accessible during the conference on the conference webpage and then on the Cody Institute's YouTube channel. If you do not wish to have your image in the recording, please turn off your camera by clicking the video camera icon in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. The video is off when there's a dialogue line through the video camera. By staying in the sections, you are agreeing to be recorded and having your image and any comments you speak accessible to the public. All chats, including private chats, are recorded. Turn off your mics when you are not speaking. To turn off your mic, click on the microphone icon in so that the dialogue stroke goes through it. Click again to turn it on. If your mic is on, you are not speaking, the text support will turn it off. To access the chat, click on the square speech bubble along the bottom of the screen. We invite all participants to post an introduction in the chat box. Kindly introduce yourself, your country, what you're doing, and where you're joining from. Secure ahead in the section, there will be opportunity for you for question and answer section, and you'll be able to identify or signify if you want to ask a question. Screenshots will be taken and posted on Cody social media account as well. Let's work together to have an enjoyable conference by turning off your mic when you're not speaking, participating mutual respect listening attentively, giving appreciative responses, remembering that our personal experience is valid, just not universal. Speaking from your own front front eye statement, if sections involve open discussion, sharing the hair, keep your comments clear and concise so that others may also speak. If you're, okay. For those that have interpretation, I don't think we have uh, room for interpretation in this section, but we'll be speaking in English language throughout the section. So once again, I want to welcome all of us here and also the speakers that will be joining us to share their experience and perspective about what next for the UNSR 2013-25. I want to welcome all of you and also welcome the Cody um, supporters that are behind the screen helping us to facilitate the platform and also helping us to engage at the back end of the discussion. So I will go ahead and share the agenda of this discussion. 
So first, I've talked about the welcome address. Next, we'll be going to introduction of the first speaker. And afterwards, we have the second speaker and the third speaker and the first speaker. In this section, we have an active listener that will be giving an observation and also summary of what she has learned throughout the section. So stay tuned and connected to enjoy the dialogue that will be going ahead. And after all the presentation, we'll have a room for an open discussion with members of the participants to share their thoughts on the presentations, majorly focusing on the issues identified and what next for the policy. Thank you all for joining us. So let me go ahead by introducing our first speaker. Her name is Roshanda Nance. She's an activist in Pakistan women's movement since the early 90s. A lawyer by profession, she has worked with numbers of NGOs on issues of violence against women and children, including women's movement program. By our work in peace started with issues of Afghan refugees and peace movement for India and Pakistan. In our volunteering capacity, she was a member of Pakistan India's People's Forum for Peace, Democracy, and UN Women, a civil society advisory member, and the Women's Regional Network. As a professional, she served one year of the country leading civil society organization for women's rights. All Rands Foundation, a resident director from May 1993 to May 2018, and as a chief operating officer, May 2008 to October 2009. Simultaneously, she ran as a global human rights field officer in Afghanistan and Pakistan as the head of field officer May 2000 and March 2001. Our former job was to head the UN Women Pakistan Federal Administered Tribal Areas Division. In a quest for knowledge that does not end with just one degree and has obtained LLM in law, Masters in Peace and Reconciliation Studies from the Conventry University. In 2019, she was appointed as a first woman for the protection of women against harassment at the workplace. Please welcome on the platform our first speaker, Roshanda Nance. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good evening. I don't know because from where people are connecting to this uh, uh, webinar, but uh, I think uh, in the COVID, the one positive thing of COVID is we are connecting with friends and people from different parts of the world. Uh, let's come to the topic because everybody knows about 1325 UN Security Council Resolution 1325. So how we uh, translated this uh, 1325 global agenda to our local or linked with local uh, women because you know it was not easy, uh, particularly where your country is not willing to consider conflict in certain areas or don't want to use the word conflict in, in any document. So how we use and strategize. So I will take these five, six minutes uh, on, on our strategy. So under the umbrella of reg women's regional network, we decided to amplify women voices from the grassroots level uh, on the issue of internal displacement. We, were, we are also focusing on the issues of refugees and the refugee uh, from the conflict area, uh, 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 from the neighboring country, for example, uh, uh, from Afghanistan. But the collecting women voices from different part of the conflict area and putting their issues on the, not at the country level, but at the same time, we connected their issues with 
the uh, with the general assembly's uh, thematic session on det for determining force um, uh, drivers for uh, uh, determining uh, drivers for the force migration so you know we we believe the 1325 is very much relevant to our south asian context either this is india pakistan and afghanistan all three countries are facing uh, internal displacement because many report demonstrates in south asia there there are number of um, high number of internal displaced persons and the pakistan constitute 48 percent of uh, internal displaced person in in entire number so that was basically uh, more important for us how we can we can use women vices and particularly the vices of women internally displaced or a vices of women uh, they they are in a refugee status so 1325 talks about how women should be part of conflict resolution how should women will be part of negotiation table so the one of the uh, area for us for for engaging women was because these women were affected by militarization and religious extremism so we try to get solution from women uh, for their because they were the most effective uh, affected group so we we reach out to women in all uh, four provinces because in pakistan we have four provinces and then we have affiliated um, uh, uh, kashmir with us the, uh, the pakistan Kash part of the kashmir so we engage with women there we are in a process but we already uh, engage with women uh, from from other part of the country so we not only engage with grassroots level women from um, from a particular group we try to get the women from with different financial status then we get women with different uh, uh, religious background because we were trying to in, uh, include women vices from uh, from the religious mon minority ethnic minority because we are living in a multicultural society so the once we when we get together and we decide we have to have one um, policy agenda because when we are talking about women so the one of the policy agenda for us was getting national idp policy because when the women were raising their voices they were suggesting um, program because most of the humanitarian aid is very top down and people go with their perceived plan and agenda so the one we try to uh, give um, recommendations related to the aid effectiveness and the second more focus was how women should be a negotiator how women could be part of uh, peace dialogue for that reason uh, for, in in afghanistan our member of wrn they 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 were able to play very effective role in a in a peace uh, talks when the uh, government of afghanistan was having the peace talks with the uh, uh, taliban at that time unfortunately in india and pakistan we are working on our profile or a roster for the women but the from both the side the government uh, uh, delegations are so male dominated we are still trying to get um, uh, space for uh, women uh, peace builders or how you say the negotiator how women in the on the peace making dialogue uh, process the one thing we find useful was taking one agenda for example when we started this agenda of getting national idp policy for women and for everyone because when we talk about women and for a particular policy so indirectly 
the men, children, and other marginalized group are also including in that uh, um, agenda. So it help us to um, get more uh, inclusion from other people because they find we are talking, we are taking their issue. When we engage with women from uh, uh, grassroots level, and they sit and we use uh, a very simple tool of community conversation. And the community conversation while you are sitting with 10 to 15 community women, giving them attention, talking to them about their issue, what they want. When I was conducting my uh, community conversation from North and South Waziristan women and this area was the most um, uh, conflict affected area due to militarization and religious extremism. So the women were very clear because the one thing which normally in our uh, South Asian context where people say women are not uh, skilled, women don't have knowledge. So I, I uh, these community conversations proved that um, or demystified that uh, um, myth about women can't be negotiator because the women were very clear how their lives were impacted by conflict, how they paid a higher price for the conflict. And at the same time, when I questioned from them, how they want to reconcile, how they want their role in the peace building process or how they want to, if they get a chance to go back to their uh, uh, areas and reconstruct their community. So they ask for three things. The one they ask for education because they said when we were internally displaced, so we realized the women in other part of the country, they, are, they have access to education. Then they said because of conflict, drone strikes and militancy, we lost uh, our um, our environment. There is a lot of destruction for in, in our water and forest. So we, we want to improve our in, uh, environment because our environment was uh, very uh, uh, good and human friendly. The third thing they, they demanded was um, economic empowerment. So this proof, this, these community, our, uh, uh, community conversations proved in Pakistan, at least women with marginalized background, with less education, they are more focused and clear as compared to men. And the same when the community conversations were conducted in India, so with, with uh, development-induced uh, displacement, women were very clear because they said this development destructed their environment, this impacted their entire in, uh, labor force in that area. So either this was Afghanistan uh, or in, in Kunduz or uh, uh, on a non-Muslim uh, Muslim and non-Muslim conflict in borderland in India and in South and North Waziristan in Pakistan. The women were very clear about their agenda, what they want, how they see the impact of militarization and uh, uh, religious extremism on their lives, on their families. So I, for that reason, the 13 um, UN Security Council uh, Resolution 1325 Practically, we try to implement on, on the ground. And we not only uh, apply on the, on the ground, we prepare all our, uh, uh, we documented this process. And finally, we connected this process, uh, particularly with the UN special uh, session, uh, General Assembly session on uh, forced migration when they were determined the um, uh, drivers for the forced migration. So then we raise and we connect and we share our experience from, from our grassroots interaction through CC with women. And we try to connect their voices 
with the UN General Assembly thematic session. So that was, there was a connection. There was a connection sitting with women at, at the local level, then uh, negotiating for inter, uh, uh, national IDP policy. Luckily, Afghanistan has the national IDP policy, but India and Pakistan, uh, we don't have national IDP policy. So then there was a, another forum where internationally we, we were trying to uh, create space for women voices from grassroots to the CEDAW session and to the UN General Assembly thematic session. So to, I just want to um, uh, uh, re-emphasize uh, on how it is possible. It's possible, it's the only thing which we lack is political commitment uh, at the part of our own governments. If the governments want, they, they can create spaces for women in the government dialogue, how they, the women can be part of these, women should be part of these government dialogue for negotiation. Either these negotiations are happening at the ground, for example, at the country level, or at the village level when uh, the government institutions are negotiating uh, with militants at the same time on the higher level international forum where we are trying to negotiate with international human rights institutions how these local um, uh, demands can be addressed through global agenda or how we can address the government, uh, 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 how we can address the internationally, the local uh, issue of women. And to conclude the, my experience, I think this is also very much related to activating uh, community voices with the international community, because on the other hand, when we are raising or connecting women voices from the local to the international, we are also setting up or we are challenging or we are doing accountability of the international community, how the international community uh, played uh, play their role uh, to engage with women on the women issues because the women can decide and women can uh, suggest better how they want the reconciliation process and the conflict resolution in their area. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Roshinda Nas, for an in-depth uh, analysis of how the struggle has been in promoting peace, uh, peace and conflict resolution at the local level at the community level and the influence of the international um, network in promoting local initiative. I'm hearing some issues around religious minority, ethnic minority, and the impact of militarization. And also about you us having one policy agenda as a strategy to address some of these issues. As a younger generation, I'm interested in some of these issues and your strategies in overcoming some of these challenges. You may mention that women don't have some of the issues where around women doesn't have knowledge, that women are not negotiator. Now coming to 20 years after, our younger generation speakers will also identify if these are still present issues that we are facing in getting women into, into the space in peace and conflict resolution. You also made mention of issues around political commitment towards the inclusion of a woman in the table, which I think is one of the pressing issues that we'll also analyze by other speakers to see how important this was. And making mention of the humanitarian head of the top-down approach, I think all your story was around having a bottom-up approach, listening to the stories of the women, the community, and devising ways from whatever experiences that they are facing. As a younger generation of women, I'm really uh, impressed by this narrative and I've also learned one or two things. 
and strategies that we can use for the next generation and how to carry the movement forward. Thank you so much for sharing. So I'll move to the next speaker who is a younger woman to share her thoughts about what is next for UNSR 1325, talking from a perspective um, as an activist, as someone who has been involved in peace and conflict movement, and also what she's hoping to do different from the older generation. Her name is Miss Perti Brandia. She's a research associate at Fantech Partners Singapore, mentored at Lali Project, Tech Teach for Indian and Leadership Mentor at She for Change, the Leadership Lab India. She has more than four years of experience in human rights, international affairs, SDG and gender in political sensitive post-conflict and on the resource environment. She has proven rec track records of working with NGOs communities and local governments. Her passion for policy and analysts stem from the same groundwork she has been doing. Our core area of interest have only shaped with her degree in political science, international affairs, gender justice, and United Nations and the international understanding. Welcome to the platform, Ms. Peretti Padia. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for giving me the floor. My warm greetings to you, the moderator, to all the other speakers, and thank you to all the participants. Uh, thank you, Cody International Institute, for hosting and inviting us all in such a prestigious conference. My heart is filled with gratitude and immense pride at the moment. Also, it was a great pleasure to listen to Rakshanda, ma'am, and I am excited to hear all about what all other speakers have uh, who shared the same experiences. Uh, my name is Preeti Pandya and I have been working in the field of human rights, international affairs, sustainable development goals and gender, especially in political sensitive, post-conflict and under-resourced environments. Today, as we all are attending this conference, we know that despite every local region's different histories and different traditions, there are remarkable similarities in terms of the key trends and problems faced by women around the world, especially in some of the most challenging and violent parts of the world. Uh, women and girls have been bearing the brunt of conflict along with inequalities that women are subjected to, to which uh, are worsened, worse uh, during a conflict, especially uh, in the Middle East, in, in, the, South Asia, in the South Asian regions and uh, many more communities which I am not aware of. Now, for over 2,500 years, war and peace has been negotiated by a handful of exclusively politically and militarized elite men. The resolution 1325 was adopted to comprehend the struggle of women and young girls in conflict prone regions. Not only has it brought in limelight the impact of, con impact of uh, armed conflict on women, but it has also contributed to sustainable uh, peace and conflict resolution with the help of women. These women are most concerned about having peace uh, because their lives and bodies, they are marked by wars. They are deeply affected by wars in the areas that have been partitioned, in the areas which are still under annexations and um, in the areas where the border disputes have not been resolved yet. Um, this event proves to be a timely opportunity to reflect on the challenges faced by the women in territories occupied by armed forces and the loopholes in implementation of the women peace and security agenda. In addition to the pre-existing inequalities which have been entrenched deeply in such societies and the post-war crisis, women are now facing the threats of COVID-19 pandemic as well. And annexation continues, which could deliver a fatal blow to the fading prospects of peace. Uh, peace could like just be, just go from zero to negative. As the 20th century, uh, as the 20th anniversary of UNSCR 1325 approaches in an increasingly volatile political situation around the world, compounded uh, by the threat of military annexations and COVID-19 shocks, disruptions, the meaningful participation of women in decision-making 
and political processes becomes as urgent as ever. Uh, having recently celebrated International Peace Day, we may reflect on the political participation of women, particularly in conflict resolution and peace building processes over the years. One needs to have a clear understanding in the context that peace and security of women and other marginalized groups cannot be achieved if it's exclusively within the frame of war and military. Resolution 1325 addresses insecurity before, during and after conflict and understands violence as something that spans from home to international fora. One of the examples could be any border dispute has affected women before it was, in a, it was a dispute, during, and some of them are still facing the repercussions even after hundreds of years have passed. Even today, some critical questions are waiting to be answered. What is the impact that the resolution has had on the lives of women and men for that matter? Uh, taking a step back, did it have any impact at all? Did UNSCR 1325 cross the threshold of international organization where it was passed? Did it make way into national legislations and policies? Did, it, did its advocates continue to uh, ensure that ensure its proper implementation? What we as younger generation need to keep in mind after all, a change is not just marked by the vision it espouses, but also by its potential to alter into reality. Nothing makes sense if it's just on a piece of paper. UNSCR 1325's translation into national legislations in form of national action plan has been quite unsuccessful because different countries are trying to absorb it in different ways and according to their own convenience. How is that going to solve the problem? Then it does not acknowledge nor addresses the structural and institutional barriers that obstruct women's participation in decision making bodies. Also, um, it also defines women as a homogeneous category, thus negating all the feminist calls for consideration of intersexual identities. Now, that being said, it is also quite important to identify the tasks at hand right now that are need that are indeed like the prerequisites to UNSCR's 1325 being called an actual success. It is a time to answer what next and how to go about it. This is, critical, this is a critical role for both international and national civil societies to ensure that the resolution moves from being a mere formal document to a living reality for majority of us. Lobbying governments um, to increase female representation in decision-making posts, advancing women's education, uh, addressing structural gender-based inequalities. These are some important steps that could be taken for more conducive space for the realization of the goals of 1325. Uh, the international civil society that was very active in bringing forth this resolution through numerous collaborations and partnerships now has to leverage its strengths to ex exert pressures on national governments, on local governments to get past the bureaucratic bottleneck and lack of political will to undertake reforms that disturb the status quo of male dominance at all levels. The annual October anniversary of Resolution 1325 has become a key influence, uh, a key inflection point in the implementation of women, peace and security agenda. It can be a moment uh, to take stock of how far gender and security discourse has come and how far it still has to go and to clarify the intersection between politics, gender, peace, security, and or to merely reflect the passage of time. In some years, uh, in some of the past years, um, certain areas such as prevention and protection uh, against the sexual and gender-based violent activities during a conflict, uh, these areas have been, like these areas have been shown serious commitment by the United Nations. However, some things like the participation of women in peace processes and decision-making mechanisms, progress has been very limited. Uh, some statistics would say that only 23% of peace operations are currently headed by women. The share of female uniformed personnel in those operations 
lies below 4%. And that of female civilian staff is just over 20%. That's, that's clearly not equality. For all the opportunities uh, that 2020 and all the subsequent years that may provide us, a, de a deceptively simple question can be used to evaluate whether a particular set of policies and programs address gaps between uh, an implementation of women, peace and security agenda. Does the policy address a need identified by relevant constituencies? If a course of action does not support the victims and survivors, if it does not hold uh, perpetrators to account, if it does not enhance women's participation, if it does not build resilience to conflict, then it is not the course of action the women, peace and security community is looking for. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for your presentation and also sharing your experience concerning your involvement in peace and conflict. I could, you know, identify some few similarities between what you've said and also the first speaker, still laying emphasis on lack of political will. You need more intersectional dialogue between gender and other sector, and also trying to really criticize the impact of this policy in the achievement of the domestication at various countries, what has the impact been on the resolution, and also national action plan has been unsuccessful in some countries, which is some of the things we need to look at. You know, the next generation are looking for answers to some of this policy. Beyond just policy and paper document, we want action, we want steps, and we also want institutional barriers to be addressed and some of the structures that affect women to be addressed while putting up a policy because of what is currently going on and also what next will have to be determined by the national CSOs and also international bodies to agree on where next we want this uh, policy to go and how it will be advancing women's education also, advancing women's education is also coming up in your presentation, which shows that we still have issues to address when it comes to women's literacy. And the lack of political will is one of the major issues that is also coming up in the second speaker. I hope all our participants are following the discussion and also trying to get similarities and ideas for the next generation. So now we'll move to the third speaker. Unfortunately, she's not available, but she sent a video of our presentation. Her name is Mojisola Ogundiron from Nigeria. She's the founder of United Nations of Youth for Peace and the Diplomacy UNYPD, and also a, a trained for United Nations for Young Peace Builder, uh, UNOY representing West and Central Africa. Mojisola is the young is a youth for peace advocate in Nigeria, working in local communities to promote youth engagement in civic activities for peace. She has initiated projects that support nonviolence, conflict trauma, healing, and young women's inclusion in peace building. In 2019, Mojisola was part of the finalists of the Outstanding Young Peace Builder during the Nigerian Youth for Peace Forum. She works in partnership with SDG, Tolze, and Working Group of Women, Youth, Peace, and Security in West Africa and Sahara to localize the Goal 16 of the Sustainable Development Goals. Robin, can we have the video presentation of Mojisola? Thank you. I am the founder of United Network of Youth for Peace and Diplomacy. I am also a trainer for United Network of Young Peace Builder, UNOY. I work to localize the goal system of the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG, and also to increase the role of young women in conflict prevention peacemaking and peace building. I'm happy to be part of the Local Women Voices for Peace conference. And I also want to thank the organizer of the conference, Cody Institute, for giving me the opportunity to share my peace building initiative. My organization, United Network of Youth for Peace and Diplomacy, UNYPD, 
focuses on promoting peace building at the individual level and at the community level. At the individual level, my organization focuses on promoting peace education. The peace education program focuses on conflict transformation and prevention and countering of violent extremism. I decided to initiate this program because I realized that many young people are living and growing up in conflict environments and they are also faced with threats of radicalization by extremist groups. So I realized that it is very important to teach young people how to identify extremist narrative and how to also relate to one another without showing violence, aggression, or even prejudice. I use curriculum-based approach to offer peace education training to young people at the community level. For instance, I use the UNOY Youth for Peace Training Toolkit to administer training on conflict transformation, conflict resolution, narrative, and forms of aid speech. And through the training, young people have understood how to engage in intercultural and interfaith dialogue, how to uh, understand themselves better uh, through the lens of uh, tolerance. In promoting individual, individual peace building, I provide support to children and youth who are victims of Boko Haram insurgency and who are currently living in the internally displaced camp. I decided to organize the program for these young people because I realized that uh, many of these children living in the internally displaced camp are faced with tragic, have experienced tragic, ex uh, tragic loss. Uh, many of them have been displaced from their homes, they've lost loved ones. To make the matter worse is that many of these children and youth are currently living in poor conditions. In the internally displaced camp where these children and youth are safe, there is, they lack basic amenities including access to water. I work as an adult facilitator providing uh, psychosocial counseling to these children and youth in the IDPs. I use mindfulness training to help these young children and youth to understand themselves, to overcome uh, negative emotions, to transform hunger. This mindfulness training also helps them to understand their personal values. These are some of the ways I, through my organization, promote individual peace building. At the community level peace building, I focus on increasing the leadership capacity of young women. Um, currently, I just launched the Young Women Teaching Peace Program. The, the Young Women Teaching Peace Program helps, helps young women who are in conflict, uh, in conflict and underprivileged areas to build their capacity to engage in civic activities for peace. I decided to initiate this program because I wanted to change the narrative that young women are only meant for marriage, are, only, are, are inexperienced and incapable of, of contributing to the society. So I decided that uh, organizing uh, a program that supports building the capacity of young women in conflict and underprivileged area is very important. Through the Young Women Teaching Peace Program, I have been able to connect young women to, to different uh, uh, capacity training programs. I also provide stipend for these young women to organize, uh, organize small meetup and also uh, organize small meetup so that they can be able to connect with themselves and share experiences among themselves, which they might not have the capacity to, to do because of their condition. Looking forward, my plan for the future is to expand the Young Women Teaching Peace program. I'm really passionate about building the capacity of young women of young women, particularly young women in conflict and underprivileged areas. I decided to engage in capacity building for young women in conflict and underprivileged areas because I realized that in Nigeria, conflict and security threats, particularly gender-based violence, have limited young women to their homes. And these young women can no longer uh, freely and comfortably go out to, to organize meetup. They can no longer freely and, and go out to uh, make friends or to engage in, a, in, 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 in a public activities outside because they are faced with threats of sexual and gender-based violence. So, so this lack of opportunities for young women in conflict and their privileged areas actually made me to uh, be interested in, in connecting them virtually and sometimes physically to opportunities that 
they may not have in, because of their present condition. So I want to expand the Young Women Teaching Peace Program. I want to connect young women to, uh, to resources, to uh, mentorship, and to, and to peer support. Currently, I, I have been able to partner with a youth organization in Nigeria, uh, Basic Rights Watch, and also a youth organization in U USA, where these uh, young women are able to uh, build their capacity, particularly their global competency, which will help them to engage in local activities for, for peace and for development. Okay, I think that's the end of the video. Thank you so much, Mojishala, for sharing your thoughts and innovative ways of uh, addressing the lack of opportunities for young women in conflict and uh, conflict areas and also can be applied to young women within the IDP camps. She has shared some of our approaches in addressing some of this lack of opportunity. <laughs> She talked about curriculum-based approach uh, due to lack of basic amenities at the uh, conflict areas. She talked about a mindfulness training and also a program on increasing the leadership capacity of young women and civic activities for young people for peace. And you know, it's all about in innovative steps young women are bringing on board in this movement to address the issue of peace and conflict resolution. So now we'll move to our active listener. We're still expecting one of our speakers who will be joining us soon. Her name is Robina. She'll be joining us soon. She's a feminist. So for now, let me introduce our active listener who has been quietly listening to the discussion going on. And I also want to encourage all participants to share your thoughts. I can see some interesting conversation on the chat box about you know different issues on local women's and women's group. Um, the world, especially the UN, must move from managing conflicts to addressing root causes of instability, contributing to building sustainable peace. Um, we also had comments on political commitment. It's often time raised as an issue. Okay, we need to talk more about that also. Let me introduce our active listener. Her name is Maria Victoria Marfix. She's a founder and the CEO of the Global Network of Women Peace Builder. Marvin initiated the Philippine National Action Plan process on the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security. She also served as an international consultant to Nepal National Action Plan. Mavic has provided technical support in 1325 National Action Plan in different countries, including Guatemala, Japan, South Sudan, and facilitated costing and budgeting workshop of 1325 National Action Plans in Georgia, Jordan, Lebanon, Nepal. She pioneered the localization of UNSR 1325 and 1820 program that is regarded as a best practice example and is now implemented in 18 countries. She co-authored books from best practice to standard practice, a toolkit on localization of UN NSR 1325 on women, peace and security and costing and financing and editing in 2010, 2011 to 2014. Mavic has facilitated workshops and discussion on women, peace and security resolution in many countries, including Afghanistan, Burundi, Colombia, Democratic Republic of Congo, Guatemala, Japan, Liberia, Nepal, Philippines, Serbia, Sierra Leone, South Africa, Uganda, and Ukraine. A mastery thesis on communication strategy on UNSR 1325 was awarded best thesis at the University of Philippines. Join me to welcome on the platform our active listener, Mariam Victoria Martins. Thank you so much, Abidun, for that. Um, kind introduction. 
and thank you to Cody for inviting me to this uh, very important conversation. As Abidun mentioned, at the Global Network of Women Peace Builders, we implement a localization of the Women, Peace and Security Resolutions in 18 countries. And this uh, strategy has been cited by the United Nations Secretary General as a key strategy for implementing the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. I am so inspired to listen to uh, Rokshanda Priti and our um, a young woman, young woman peace builder from Nigeria, from the UN Youth for Peace and uh, Diplomacy, because uh, the thoughts, the information, the insights that they have shared are very much in line with uh, the global network of women peace builders' vision for the Women, Peace and Security Resolutions, and that is to walk the talk. Localization is about walking the talk. Lo localization is about taking this uh, groundbreaking resolution, especially resolution 1325 and 1820 and 1888 on sexual violence and conflict from New York uh, to the capital and from the capital to local communities that are directly affected by conflict. And now with the pandemic uh, all around us, we have a teachable moment that we need to seize that the resolution can only be translated into real actions, into necessary and practical actions on the ground through localization. If local communities, local populations embrace it as an instrument to realize their aspiration for peace, for sustainable development, for um, uh, equality and justice for all. And uh, it's a teachable moment because it also highlights our uh, connectedness with each other. Our connectedness have never been as um, emphasized as now. And that um, when we talk of women, peace and security, we're only, we're not talking only of national security, meaning securing the state or securing the uh, politicians who run our governments, but it's about securing the, all the needs of, of, um, of people. In other words, the, the human security framework, which is about health security, which is about economic security, which is about food security. And as we know, there's massive um, um, hunger in many places of the world and uh, food insecurity and economic insecurity are drivers of conflict along with gender inequality. So it's, a, it's an, uh, as um, uh, the saying goes, we should not let a good crisis go to waste. We need to seize it to transform the ways we work. We do not say, we should not be saying, we need to go back to normal. We need to create a new normal that is more inclusive, more equal, and, um, uh, and, and uh, women's rights are at the center of all our work in the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, but also in implementing all other international and national and regional policies related to that. I would like to um, yeah, point out some of the key um, takeaways that I have from our panelists. So, um, I, I really appreciate Roxanda's, Roxanda's uh, uh, point about community conversations. I know the Women's Regional Network for Afghanistan, Pakistan, and um, India. I've uh, spoken in, in one of their convening and um, I've, I've worked with, with some of them. Um, community conversations are an important, important avenue to hear from the local populations, that they are not just the uh, recipient of decisions of uh, policymakers, but they are active participants in, in shaping those decisions 
in uh, presenting their views how policies are working or not working and it's it's a key uh, strategy in localization because as Roxanda mentioned it demystifies the myth that women are not qualified to be peace negotiators to be peace leaders peace builders and and decision makers because they leave the conflict uh, in, in local communities affected by uh, violent conflicts, including violent extremism. Women in local communities leave the challenges of insecurity on a day-to-day -day basis. And because of that, they have a profound uh, analysis of how it impacts them. And more importantly, they have solutions to offer. This is also a key point in our messaging that it's important to say that women have the right to participate. We have uh, international laws as like the CEDAW or Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination against women. And many countries have um, ratified this, the CEDAW Convention, but the the policies as we know is often do not reflect the reality so listening to the women through um, the community conversations this proves that they don't have the capacity they do they just need to be recognized uh, more support needs to be provided and many of you have by the way emphasized political commitment but the political commitment should also be matched with financial resources and other forms of support um, and I also um, you know I like the point that uh, she presented that women are very clear women know what they want and these are the practical solutions that i was talking about that women know how to solve their problems that's why i have a, i also have concerns when when we say we need to build the capacity we need to organize training we need to organize workshop to build the capacity of uh, local populations it it doesn't recognize framing what we want to do that way doesn't recognize their inherent capacity. So I'd rather say, let's enhance what they already have. Enhancing their capacities is building on recognizing and supporting what they already have in them. Their, their skills, their agency, their, their, their insights about uh, their problems and concerns. Um, economic empowerment is also critical. Roxanda has also emphasized this. Um, women are often trapped in abusive situations, whether in, you know, in their intimate relationship or uh, with their husbands or, or uh, partners, but also in uh, abusive um, work environment because of money or lack of it uh, because of lack of economic opportunities and as i mentioned earlier poverty and food insecurity are two of the most important drivers of conflict and the sad reality at the moment uh, women do not have those women do not have uh, or have limited or do not you know have uh, economic uh, independence and uh, because of that they also are they and their families are often food insecure um, pretty also um, emphasis yeah uh, moving on to some of Preeti's points uh, what what she was uh, presenting also reinforces uh, Roxanda's points uh, particularly um, I uh, her point about a conflict not or that we cannot resolve conflict through plain military solution and this has been proven many many times uh, why are there why are there lingering conflicts uh, the Security Council on the Security Council's agenda there are about 32 
um, national and regional conflicts that impact internationally. And you would see that many of these are lingering conflicts. Conflicts uh, in Afghanistan, for example, this has been, the war in Afghanistan has been going on since the 70s. I have a friend uh, from Afghanistan who said, I was born and raised in conflict. I was, you know, I grew up amidst the war. I want to see a different future for my children. Why did the conflict in Afghanistan uh, continued for about 40 years now? Why did the conflict in Colombia went on and still going on despite their peace agreement for, you know, uh, in, that was adopted in 2006 or signed in 2000, uh, 2016, but the war has been going on for more than 50 years. Same thing for my country. The war in some parts of my country, like in Mindanao, has been going on for more than 60 years. Why? Because the main solution that the... Um, a governments adapt is a military solution. And unfortunately, this is also supported by the international community. War is a very profitable business for uh, many people, even governments. And until and unless we shift from a militaristic solution to ensuring human security, the wars will only continue and will serve the interest of the few who are profiting for arms manufacturing and arms trading. And uh, it's, it's not easy uh, to, to do, uh, to shift from a military solution to a solution that addresses the root causes of conflict, but it is possible. It is possible. And, and uh, we don't have any alternative to hoping and taking action to make the shift from a military solution to addressing the root causes of conflict, which are poverty, inequality, injustices, human rights violation, violations, um, a reality. We, we need, uh, and as I uh, emphasize again, we need to seize the moment that this pandemic is giving us to, to shift into uh, a broader, uh, and a broader uh, framework of human security that addresses the root causes of conflict. Um, I completely agree that uh, the 20th anniversary of uh, Resolution 1325, which I believe is also one of the uh, spirit behind the organizing of this uh, series of webinars by Cody International Institute, is a global momentum for us to again, uh, remind the policymakers, remind donors, remind ourselves that uh, we have enough number of resolutions. We have 10 resolutions now on women, peace and security. And we have learned that uh, Russia, who has the presidency of the Security Council in October, is also proposing uh, another um, resolution. We don't have a shortage of resolutions. We have a shortage in implementation. And we need to take stock of our achievements in the last uh, 20 years, especially civil society, because it's civil society that has kept the resolutions alive in the last 20 years. It's civil society, especially local women's rights organizations, grassroots civil society, who have, uh, um, who, who breath life into these resolutions, who, who um, um, transform them from uh, uh, documents uh, on paper to instruments that could change the lives of women, especially in local communities affected by conflict. So in, when, when we look, this also brings me to um, localization as a bottom-up strategy. So we are actually presenting, those of us who are working on localization, we are actually revolutionizing the way policymaking and policy implementation is taking place. From top to bottom approach where 
policymakers talk among themselves and then agree and sign and adopt and then they ram it down the throats of the people especially local communities for them to adapt so here's a resolution here's a policy we have approved it implement it we are changing that uh, culture uh, top-down approach of policy making and policy implementation to a bottom-up approach that uh, recognizes local populations capacity to run their day-to-day -day community affairs to implement um, local laws and policies that are that make sense to them however if we are not able to elevate the local successes that we have in local communities i see robina will be speaking um, later um, for example, an, a very uh, important uh, success story from some of the uh, communities, the, the local districts that Rubina has worked in, and we have partnered with Co Act 1325 on this, on the localization program, is um, yeah, they were able to increase or, or increase the uh, reporting on uh, sexual and gender based violence, which is very important in not just knowing the extent of the problem, but also in, in holding uh, the uh, duty bearers to account, uh, which could lead to ending impunity on sexual violence. If we are not able, and in Sierra Leone, I see that there are several uh, participants in, uh, from, from Sierra Leone, uh, we have worked in nearly all of the local districts, including with Paramount Chiefs, uh, wherein they, uh, some paramount chiefs um, in uh, Kinema district, for example, they have uh, adopted in their local laws that they will discourage um, uh, early marriage. They will, uh, they don't sanction early marriage and, and they also um, discourage uh, female genital mutilation. Steps, uh, problems like that, as we know, um, deny girls and young women opportunities. Uh, sexual and gender-based violence is both a cause and, um, a cause and um, consequence of, of uh, conflict. If we are able to uh, um, elevate these local successes, it will gradually change national policies. It will uh, influence other countries in, in looking at their policies. So the point that I'm making is that if we are not able to elevate those successes in Sierra Leone, in Uganda, and different countries, what we are talking about as a bottom-up approach will remain bottom-bottom because they are um, isolated success stories that do not influence national, regional, and international policies. So um, by sharing our stories, by highlighting our successes, as well as by recognizing our challenges, especially during this 20th anniversary, we can transform the, the talk into the walk that is needed on the ground. And um, at this point, I also want to share a couple of um, well um, information that um, uh, that are important in our conversation or information about global opportunities. So there's a lot of convening uh, in um, uh, in October around the anniversary of 1325. Member states and the UN are um, including with international civil society and some national civil society are, are um, organizing countless Zoom meetings and virtual conferences. But to me, what is more important is what will happen on the ground. What do we, our discussions on the ground and letting uh, all international actors know about them. And often uh, the, the convening on the ground will not be, will not, will not happen on Zoom, will not happen, you know, using all of these um, internet platforms. But we need to find ways to, to present those. And we need to 
to uh, ensure that there are more and more um, more and more of those community conversations. But the other uh, opportunity, so that's the uh, momentum of the 20th anniversary. Uh, we in New York, working with um, networks like the NGO Working Group, we're ensuring that the Security Council Open Debate will have um, uh, speakers from civil society. And the, press, uh, the, yeah, the, the Russian government has already agreed to our proposal to have someone from Afghanistan to be one of the civil society speakers. But the other important opportunity is the Compact on Women, Peace and Security and Humanitarian Action that was uh, created out of our advocacy for the integration of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda into the Generation Equality Forum. What is the Generation Equality Forum? The Generation Equality Forum is the, um, um, the commemoration of the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Action, which is the, um, uh, one of the most, if not the most, um, comprehensive agenda for women's empowerment. And it has been, you know, uh, touted that's one of the most important convening um, during um, this year. And, but COVID happened, so the general Generation Equality Forum, which was to take place in Paris in, in July, did not happen. But it will, it's still happening next year. Um, um, that's the um, decision of the core group um, composed of France, Mexico, and uh, UN women and two civil society representatives. But um, what is interesting about the Generation Equality Forum is they completely set aside the Women, Peace and Security agenda. They adapted um, action coalitions on fem feminist leadership, uh, um, violence against women, uh, um, um, Climate, climate change and, and three others, but there's no Women, Peace and Security Action Coalition. So we raised our voices. We, we, uh, some of you have participated in these conversations. And finally, they create, the core group uh, agreed to form the, com, uh, the Compact on Women, Peace and Security and Humanitarian Action. And the purpose of the compact is to accelerate the imp implementation of women, peace and security agenda, bringing and, and giving emphasis also on the role of young women. They did not agree to putting YPS or the youth peace and security agenda in the title, but they agreed to um, a full integration of uh, youth voices in the process of the compact. Uh, the other interesting point about the compact is it's bringing humanitarian action with women, peace and security as a recognition of the fact that most of the humanitarian emergencies are driven by armed conflict. So the compact is, is an opportunity for all of us to uh, bring local voices to the global conversation in translating the women, peace and security, the words of the women, peace and security resolutions into necessary and practical actions on the ground. I'll stop here and look forward to our uh, conversation, continuing conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mavic, for your, you know, you know, summary of the whole presentation and also sharing your thoughts. There has been nice conversation going on while you were talking on the chat box on addressing local problems. The women know how to address their problems, involvement of men in building peace and conflict among women, addressing the root causes and recognizing local resources. Thank you so much for, for your summary and also sharing your thoughts about localization of UNSR 1325 and what next to be done. And also for all our participants, keep, your, keep the conversation going, share your thoughts, and also provide further recommendation. So I will be introducing our last speaker for this section. She's Robina Rubinwa. She's one of the feminist and professional educationalists at the Education Specialist Cum Gender Activist a mediator and a peace builder. She's a founder and the executive director of Coalition for Action on 1325, an alliance of women's organization 
working to increase the peace and security of women and girls. On establishing that the landmark resolution was not widely known in Uganda and not implemented, she pioneered the localization of the resolution at local level, a process that enables local government identity identity issues that undermine the peace and the security of women and girls within the communities and design and implement local actions plan to address those issues. She trained CSOs, legislators, government officials, security sector personnel, local authority on UNSR 1325 and the WPS agenda and the youth encountering violent extremists and election-related violence. She's a UN Women Consultant on Development of National Action Plan on the resolution. She has facilitated National Action Plan process, processes in Burundi, Sierra Leone, Kenya, and Uganda. She has made numerous presentations on women, peace, and security at the national, regional, and global level. Please welcome on the platform, Robina Gumbiwa. Thank you. Thank you, ACX. Um, sorry, I joined you a little late as I was in another meeting. Uh, but of you, as you heard, um, that's me, Robin Arimba. Um At the Coalition for Action on 1325, we work on the different areas of gender equality and women empowerment. Some of our members build women's leadership for politics and governance. Others increase women's economic empowerment. Others work on women's access to justice. Others work on institutional and community capacity enhancement for the prevention and response to gender-based violence, and particularly sexual violence, which is a huge challenge for Uganda. But others uh, work on increasing women's participation in peace and security processes. I have lived through conflict personally at 26 years of age and a young mother of two babies, a two year old and a six months old baby. I had to flee Uganda into exile. I was following my husband who had fled five months earlier I lived as a refugee for seven years. And while I was away, I lost a brother whom I could not even uh, bury. So the work that I do is very personal to me because I do not want another woman to experience what I went through, both as I fled Uganda, but also as a refugee. Uganda has a population of about 43 million people, but 10 million of these live on one dollar or less a day. It is a conflict-affected country and has been through various violent conflicts since independence in 1962. The most well-known conflict, perhaps, apart from the eight years of Idi Amin, is the 20-year armed conflict between the government of Uganda and the Lord's Resistance Army led by Joseph Kony. This started in 1996 and went on. It started in 1986 and went on until 2006. Now, Uganda is a multicultural, multi-religious, and multi-ethnic country with numerous tribes, some large, some small, and each has its own language, its own local language. Our official language is English, but in the villages, people use their own uh, vernacular. The conflicts we deal with currently include violent extremism in the Renzori region and the central part of the country, Inter-ethnic conflicts, some of these have gone on since colonial times, 
and usually are linked to uh, political power, they are linked to uh, fights over water for production and land for pasture or for agriculture. But in the recent uh, years, like from 2001, we have also experienced a lot of political conflicts and election-related violence has become the norm, whether it is general elections or small by elections. But we also, as a country, experience a lot of arbitrary arrests and torture by security agencies. And across the entire country, we have consultations for the design of our third now in August. And across the entire country, all communities talked about land-related conflicts. There is a culture of impunity with the rich individuals grabbing the land of the majority poor and leaving them without livelihoods. But we also have a huge influx of refugees. And many of these are from South Sudan. They are from the Democratic Republic of Congo, Burundi, and Somalia. We host over 1.4 million refugees and are the world's second largest refugee hosting country. So as a country, we have unique challenges. Um, we have a good legal and policy regime for gender equality and women empowerment, although implementation remains a challenge. We implement quotas for women. And this has enabled 35% uh, of women, 35% uh, of parliament are women, 46% of local councils are women. And as stated a little earlier, we are now in the final stages of the design of our third national action plan that has involved a very inclusive process and has been bottom up for the first time. Um, so the country has an empowering legal and policy framework, but implementation, I believe, like most of uh, the developing world, remains a big challenge. Now, the women of Uganda have for a long time been involved in concrete prevention and peace building initiatives, even before Resolution 1325. And some were actually part of civil society advocacy for passing this resolution. Um, personally, I have been part of peace processes since 2003. As part of the Women's School Peace Corps that rose up to provide for women living in internally people's displaced camps in with the Lord's Resistance Army. We advocated for the peace talks because both government and the rebels did it. But when they, both sides agreed to the peace talks and the government selected a delegation to the peace talks, it, it included no woman, zero, zero women. But the women of Uganda wouldn't have it. So as a result, we mobilized ourselves and headed to Cuba. The women at the time were so determined and they were like, if it means walking, we shall walk to Cuba. And the first day actually was a huge walk, flagged off the speaker. And uh, uh, the private sector was concerned and the uniform supported this. So, though we were not uh, official delegates in South Sudan and Juba, we were able to influence the peace agreement from behind the scenes by engaging the government delegates every evening and during coffee breaks. So the final peace agreement reflected a lot of our input. After the gun fell silent, we formed the National Women's Task Force for a gender responsive peace and recovery program for the conflict affected region of Northern Uganda. 
and we were able to transform its implementation because even women at the local level, we were able to mobilize women at the local level within the districts and sub counties to form sub national task forces for a gender responsive program. In 2010, Coordinated by the Global Network of Women Leaders, 25 CSOs and government agencies to participate. But realizing that the resolution was not known, even by actors that were meant to implement it, leave alone the women that were meant to benefit from the utilization program that I had been exposed to through presentations by Mavic in a different fora. Now, it is tough doing peace building work anywhere. In Uganda, in particular, we have our own challenges. We have elements that counter progress towards gender equality. These include the negative personal values that regard power relations between men and women uh, that treat women as a second class citizenry. We have barriers to women's land ownership. We have unequal access to the education for boys and girls. While at the entry into grade school, there are more girls than boys, but by the time they reach fourth grade, the women, the girls, violence, Excuse specifically me. violence against women, and especially sexual violence. We have few women in decision making uh, and in the, in the security sector, but we have adopted very creative strategies to implement the women peace and security agenda. Excuse me, Rabina, you have one more minute. Yeah, I'm about to finish. Okay, um, great. Our first strategy, which is our pro flagship program, is localization that Mavic has talked about. And for us, our localization emphasizes human security. The output of our localization is a local action plans that reflect not so many boot camps for young men, women and men in peace building. Those that we, we train in peace building, we run boot camps for them. And we just concluded one two weeks ago. We also hold community dialogues, bringing men and women together, religious and spiritual leaders together. We also have women's peace tables at community level, where women come together them, and then they send a representative to talk to the leaders responsible. We also run a Young Women's Peace Academy, which we are using to build the next generation of women peace mediators. We use radio quite a lot, talk shows and spot messages, but we also work with women in parliament, and this support our work. We are using peace committees as civil society, but government has taken this so now, and we have the conflict, uh, conflict are no, I say well, the the conflict are warning and are response unit. So we work with this unit to establish peace committees, and we work with them to train peace committees. We have influenced the criteria to make sure. Uh, that's but we also use profiling. We profile local governments that are doing an outstanding job in implementing localization. We profile women's local CDOs, and we profile individual women that are doing outstanding work. And we also work with the refugee women, training them so that they can be elected to a refugee welfare 
since he started, there was hardly a refugee, even a non refugee, oh. where politics. But Pardon now, Pardon me, Rabina, thank you, but we need to stop there. We're already over time. Thank you so much for sharing what is happening on the ground in Uganda and all the, the work and providing such a rich description of the context, how women have come together, how they have all the diverse strategies that have been implemented. It's really a great example of the localization of 1325. And I hope that you might have some, some, some links or information that you can share with us that we can share with other with the participants um, of this conference. So my apologies, but because we have another session coming up in um, at, um, at the, on the hour here in, in Canada, we need to um, release this uh, Zoom account so that that session can get set up. So that's why we have to um, have to kind of bring this to a close. So my name is Robin Neustader and I am a program teaching staff at the Cody and assistant professor in adult education and community development at St. Francis Xavier University. I want to thank all our speakers today, Rokshanda, Priti, Mojisola, and Rabina. And I also want to thank our, our keynote listener, Mavic, for, for joining us, um, for sharing your about your work and your visions for 1325 in the in the you know in the present the work that you've done in the past the work that you've done in the present and where you see 13 to 85 needing to go in the future this is a important conversation for all of us and as we're you know coming to the close of this conference then um you know it's something that we can all kind of think and reflect upon together as we move forward so i want to thank you all for coming and spending this time with us to reflect and think about the future. So thank you everyone and I wish you all a very wonderful day. And just, um, you can please carry on this conversation in the discussion forum on the conference webpage. Also, if this has provoked some interesting reflections, thoughts, art or poetry for you, we encourage you to submit a proposal to our contributions um, submission of contributions for e-publication on Local Women's Voices for Peace, which is also on the conference webpage. So thank you very much. Have a great day.